Hi, everyone. Welcome back to some organic chemistry. Hey, so we're going to continue our discussion about these crazy reactions involving the alpha carbon, substituting that alpha hydrogen and turning it into a nucleophile to do some, actually, chemistry we've seen before. But it's a little, it's kind of masked, it's a little camouflaged because the molecules we're dealing with are larger than what we're accustomed to. So let's take a look back at key concepts. Uh, actually, let's just go to the first one of unit four. There we go. Key concepts, unit four, part one. We started this in the previous lecture, preview, previous video. So go back and review that if it doesn't look familiar. But here's our um, carbonyl group, in this case, a ketone. It could be an aldehyde, could be an ester. It's a molecule that possesses a carbon-oxygen double bond. And then the old way of labeling things is you start with the most important group, the C double bond O in this case, and the next carbon is your alpha carbon. Where's my pen? There it is. Either side is alpha, kind of weird. And then you continue with the Greek lettering system after that. But we can just stop at the alpha carbon because there's where the hydrogen is. Let's go back to this carbonyl down here. Here's our alpha carbon and the alpha hydrogens. And with a little base, or well, if you just show the equilibrium reaction, if one of these hydrogens comes off, you create a carbanion, carbon with a negative charge, anion of carbon, carbanion, and that's resonance stabilized. And more importantly, in the resonance structure, oxygen holds on to the negative charge, and oxygen's electronegative at least more so than carbon, and that's what stabilizes this and makes it possible. Okay, so last lecture video, we saw malonic esters do some interesting chemistry, SN2 reaction actually, and we also saw um, the acetoacetic ester synthesis, which had the exact same mechanism, it just had a different starting material. Now we're gonna round out these alpha substitution reactions. Um, you might call them the alkylation of enolate ions, putting alkyl groups on these enolates, specifically this one. We want to put a carbon, an alkyl group, on this carbon. So let's finish it out with direct alkylation. So this ends this set of key concepts, part one. And um, I like this one the best because it's the shortest, <laughs> right? The malonic ester synthesis and the acetic ester synthesis, long mechanisms, not so here. So here we go. Um, there's three functional groups that can do direct alkylation, ketones, esters, and nitriles. Um, I guess I'll draw in the C and I'll keep zigzagging it. Although remember, nitriles, triple bonds are SP hybridized. They're actually linear about these atoms. Yeah, okay, so bad habit there, zigzagging. But it helps us count the carbons, so I'm gonna leave it. Um, direct alkylation, what is that involved? Well, we need an enolate, this common theme. So we need to remove the alpha hydrogen. Okay, so let's actually indicate the alpha hydrogen. For the ketone, it's either side, right? The most important functional group is a carbonyl. The next carbon, either side is alpha. Um, I'm gonna pick this side. Okay, and then here's our carbonyl group. Either side, wait, for the ester, one side's an oxygen. There's no hydrogen on this oxygen. So you have to go to the other side. Here's your alpha hydrogen. Good. And then in this molecule, the nitrile, carbon nitrogen triple bond, that's the most important group. Next carbon's right here, that's your alpha hydrogen. All right, now we need a strong base. We need a base, a very strong base, and the typical one is LDA. Ah, structure of it's right over here. Let's scroll down so you can see it. Um, LDA, L stands for lithium, DA stands for diisopropyl amide. Sodium amide is something we've used for quite a while, right? We use that to take the hydrogen off of a triple bond. 
So it's a very powerful base. And we then did an SN2 reaction with the triple bond being used as a nucleophile, right? So the old reaction last semester is you have lone pair on the, the end of the triple bond is your nucleophile, strikes as methyl halide and kicks out the leaving group, the bromine, and then that connects the methyl group to the end of the triple bond. Maybe I'll draw it like that. Okay. And all we're doing is just changing our nucleophile. We're going to do the exact same reaction. One little minor difference. Um, we're going to switch to this bulky base. So sodium amide, not very bulky, right? Small molecule. Um, but we put on these bulky isopu isopropyl groups. And that bulks up this base so it doesn't do a nucleophilic reaction on its own. Um, so we, got, we can either just write LDA and that pulls off this hydrogen and makes the enolate. If you wanna draw the rest of the structure of this, you can, but you don't have to. Um, you can also just draw the structure if you want of LDA. There we go. That's one way of drawing it. And if you wanna put in charges, you can, or you can leave them out and remove that hydrogen. the nucleophile over here, the carbanion on this side. Carbanion or enolate, your choice. And then here's alpha hydrogen there. That kind of looks like a smiley face. <laughs> okay, and then we're gonna do an SN2 reaction. That's the second step. And again, um, just like we saw in malonic ester synthesis, it's acetic ester synthesis, the um, SN2 reaction is sensitive to bulk, to crowding, and so you can't use a secondary halide. Um, and that's because your nucleophiles, these molecules, are already pretty big and crowded. They're bulky. So we're restricted to do our SN2 reactions in the second step with either a methyl halide. We might as well just use bromomethane again. Or you can use a primary one. So you can shake it up. Let's have something like this. And it doesn't have to be bromine. That's my favorite halide. What else can we have? Um, you can bulk things up as long as you get them away from, you know, so if you had some branches here or something like that. Um, way down here, though, might be your primary halide. Okay, so this area of the molecule is not very crowded. This it should still work. Okay, and these should definitely work. And so what happens, SN2 happens. This carbon with its lone pair strikes this carbon, wherever the halide is, displaces the, the halide, that's the leaving group. And I'll connect this methyl group onto the end of the ketone. And when you're drawing it, you decide how you wanna draw it. If you draw it like this, that's the same molecule, your choice. Okay, what are we gonna do here? This carbon bears a halide, so we got four carbons in a row connecting to the end of the ester. So let's draw the ester. And then right here is where the enolate is. And then draw four more carbons. There's my four carbons of the alkyl halide, and then just connect the two together. The other thing you should get in the habit of doing is counting your carbons. There's one, two, three, four here. There's one, two, three, four here. There's a total of eight coming together. So there better be eight in my product. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good, okay. Now just make sure you don't lose a half a point or more on an exam if you accidentally draw the wrong structure. It's easy to lose a carbon or add one accidentally when the molecules are getting kind of big. All right. Same pattern here, even though this looks weird. I know, where's my C double bond? Oh, it's a nitrile. They work too. Um, and then the alpha carbon's over here. So let's draw that. One, two, three. And then the C triple bond in. And then this molecule, the only change is that this primary halide, this primary carbon, we're doing substitution, S, S substitution, S and two lose the iodide group and connect this carbon. So 
this carbon connects where the iodine used to be. Used to be. So let's draw the rest of this and put this carbon next to this one. So if I draw in the I here, I'm not gonna do that. That's where it would go. I got this and then I drew in the benzene ring here. That's ugly. Let's try it again. It's a little better. Okay, they look close. Count my carbons, I got six in the ring and then here's seven, eight, nine, ten. Six in ring, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. And I got methyl branches. Okay, they're the same. And we're just going to connect these together. This iodide, the carbon where the iodide was, connects to the alpha carbon over here. And if you want to redraw this so that this whole chain zigzags nicely, you can, but you don't have to. At least not on my exams. What else do we didn't know? Um, okay, that's the pattern. You have to use LDA. Let's quickly rationalize that. Why? <laughs> Why we restricted LDA? Um, technically, other bases can work, but they have to be as strong as LDA. Okay, so here, it all goes back to that order of basicity video, the, the strength of bases. So here's, um, this is a, a list of pK values. That's how we can rank our acids based on the pK value. Carboxylic acids, hey, there's acids in the name. That must be acidic. It's the strongest one on this list. Good, we're good. Okay, and then when the carboxylic acid acts as a base, it creates its conjugate base. Let's just draw it the same way. So if we put the H here, it'd be the same molecule. Okay, here's a conjugate base. And then here, this 1,3-diketone, that's not the IUPAC name, right? It's just a general way to classify this. If you have two ketones separated by one carbon, that makes it quite acidic because nature says, hey, when this alpha carbon, <laughs> and not these other alpha carbons, but the one in the middle, when that alpha hydrogen is lost as H+, you create this conjugate base. And then you can make enolates with either the oxygen on the left or on the right. You get two more resonance structures. And in those resonance structures, the oxygens carry the negative charge. And nature says that's a pretty good situation. So it's not as good as this where you have resonance structures where in all your resonance structures, the oxygen has the negative charge but it's not too bad. You got three resonance structures and in two of them, the oxygen bears a negative charge. And then there's something about having an ester group here that makes this less acidic. Two esters, not so much. And then we have the alcohol group. And then water goes right in here. Oh, I think it's 15.74 is the pK value. When water loses the hydrogen, you get hydroxide ion. And then um, let's stop right there as we go down the list. And so now we know, as a review, we all should know that when you look at the pK values, um, the lower the number, the more acidic it is. And the higher the number, the less acidic. And then when you compare the conjugate bases, the order is inverted, right? Your stronger base is here and your weaker one is here. And it's all about nature's tendency to do a reaction to create something more stable. So why does a strong acid want to lose a hydrogen? So it can become something pretty stable, this resin stabilized conjugate base. How come water doesn't want to lose hydrogen? Because it forms this anion that's quite basic. It doesn't have any resonance structures. Wait, how come the alcohol is even less acidic than water? Well, we got a methyl group here, which remember from benzene chemistry, a methyl group is an orthopara weakly activating group. On benzene, a methyl group will donate some electrons and make the benzene ring more reactive towards electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, those benzene reactions. 
while the methyl group on oxygen is doing the same thing. The methyl group saying, hey, oxygen, have more electrons. And this oxygen is like, wait, I already have a minus one charge. Why are you giving me more electrons? That makes it more basic, more negative, wants to react. Go grab an H plus and go back to being, hey, let's just get rid of all that charge. Okay. Um, direct alkylation. That's where you go down and you look at, oh, this isn't going to erase. Sorry. Annotate, go back on, clear it. Go away so I can scroll the page. <laughs> there we go. And there's LD at the bottom. <clears throat> so now we look at direct alkylation, which happens for ketones, happens for esters and nitriles. It does, when we've been avoiding the thioester, we probably shouldn't, but most organic text textbooks kind of make it a minor topic, so I left it out. And then aldehydes, why is it not in the list? In just a few minutes, we'll show you what happens when an aldehyde reacts with a base, does something different. Okay, so direct alkylations can be performed on ketones, esters, and nitriles. You have to remove the alpha hydrogen. And if you can remove it, then you create its conjugate base. So instead of three hydrogens all over there, there's only two. And then this carbon is your carbanion. Um, we got the ester, gonna do the same thing. And the nitrile does the same thing. Okay, and now, at the top, farther up at 15.74 is water, creating this conjugate base. And we said, hey, um, where's our strong acids among these, these compounds? It's up here. This, the lower the pK value, 15, makes for stronger acids. And the higher pK value, 25, that's higher, that's your weaker acid. But how do you, how you compare the bases? Well, if you can pull off this hydrogen, which is weak, it doesn't want to come off, but if you force it, then yikes, you make something really reactive. That's your stronger base. And so this is a much stronger base than hydroxide ion. It's the weaker one. And so here's the explanation. Why can't we use sodium hydroxide from Gen Chem? It's called a strong base. And now we're in organic chemistry and we're like, hmm, we know of some stronger bases. And now this hydroxide ion is too weak to pull off a hydrogen off of this very weak acid. You can't even do it effectively with ketones. Okay, so you need something stronger. So how do you get a stronger base? Well, look for a weaker acid. How about this group with isopropyl groups on it? So nitrogen with two isopropyl groups. If you remove that hydrogen, ouch, it's going to be tough to do. Weaker -er acid. It's not the weakest. Oh, maybe on this chart it is. There's nothing listed after this, but you know there are molecules like alkanes. They're even, sorry, four of those. They're even weaker than the amines, weaker acids. But if you pull that hydrogen off, the conjugate base is very powerful. It's a very um, unstable, very reactive base, very strong base. Uh, I'm just gonna draw these in here. And if your lithium ion is the conjugate, I'm sorry, is the uh, counter ion of this list on the page, this will be your strongest base. And now this strong base can remove the hydrogen off of these stronger acids. There you go. Okay, so that's the explanation. Hopefully that's helpful remembering. You got to use LDA for direct alkylation. Um, just to throw this in, just so you're aware of it, you got a methyl group. If you remove the methyl group, I think the pK is around 60. It's crazy high. Then you make your most powerful bases, carbanions that are not resonance stabilized. And one way is not have a lithium, but you can. Um, another way is to have a magnesium as a counterion. And you have a Grignard reagent. Yeah, so Grignard reagents 
very powerful bases. And I suppose you could do direct alkylation using a grignard, but it takes a, you know, takes a couple of steps to get to the grignard. Why don't you just go and buy some LDA? It's such a common base. It's easier to do. All righty, let's see what else do we need to know about this direct alkylation. Oh, we haven't seen the mechanism. And sometimes you can get more than one reaction happening. So let's talk about those two ideas. Uh, and just checking off my bullet points, we just rationalized why sodium hydroxide is not a strong enough base. And we gotta memorize the mechanism. So let's take a look at that. So the mechanism is the same for ketones, esters, and nitriles, so I don't know, should we just do the nitrile reaction? You can do the ketone one too, whatever you wanna do. Um, here's the mechanism, mechanism. Let's add LDA, I'll draw the structure. Again, lithium's not what makes this molecule so strongly basic, it's the nitrogen with the negative charge. It's gonna remove the alpha hydrogen, oh. I should probably draw that in here. So my mechanism might be a little easier to see this bond. Um, the base removes H plus, so the hydrogen comes off, leaving behind the bonding electrons. And they form these two electrons in the bond. One line equals two dots, right? That's supposed to be a curved arrow. One line equals two dots. Yeah, that becomes a lone pair of our, well, it's sort of like an enolate. It is a resonance stabilized anion. You don't have to draw it, so I'll put in parentheses, but the idea is that this lone pair can make a double bond to the carbon and then one of these pi bonds moves on to the nitrogen as a second lone pair. And now the negative charge is, is being carried by nitrogen, not as good as oxygen, but better than carbon in terms of electronegativity and stability, right? Nitrogen is more electronegative. This form of the anion is much more stable than this form because carbon, less electronegative, it's holding on the negative charge here, but nitrogen is better. Well, it's stabilizing the negative charge because of, it, because of its greater electronegativity. Didn't have to show that, but that's the rationale why this is forming. Why is alpha hydrogen sick and not this one? Yeah, so if you pull off a different hydrogen, it's too far away from these pi bonds, you can't get a resonance structure. So it doesn't happen. All right, that's step one, simple acid base step. Sweet, done. SN2, ooh, I like those. It's one step, two arrows. Bring in your alkyl halide. Yeah, I don't know. Let's draw a, a methyl group. Attach to, I usually do bromine. I'll put a chlorine in this time. Here's our SN2 reaction. Start with the nucleophile, not this lone pair, but this one, this is more reactive. It's gonna strike this carbon, the one attached to the halide. Out it goes, and then this carbon becomes attached to this one. And let's draw the product down here. So I'm gonna start with the nitrile group, or the molecule containing the nitrile group. And this carbon's gonna connect to this one. And then keep your methyl group. There we go. Nice. Let's do it one more time, using maybe the ester group or the ketone. Let's do the ester. I may I'll draw a skeletal drawing. So start with an ester. And we'll add LDA. You still have to draw the nitrogen so I can get a lone pair. So you can't write LDA. You need the letter N, the nitrogen atom, which has the, the lone pair, it's your base. Okay, and then go after the alpha hydrogen. So let's draw that in. Here's our car carbonyl group. Here's the hydrogen, lone pair, go, group, go grab that hydrogen. And then this bond makes a U-turn, 
to form your enolate. Make a charge, and then we do our SN2 reaction. We can use the same one, or we don't have to. How about we use benzyl bromide? This is primary. It's getting kind of bulky, but it should work. Lone pair attacks in here, kicks out the halide. Quick little direct alkylation reaction. Got my ester connects to this carbon, the benzylic carbon, and that connects to benzene. There we go. There's our product. Sweet. Check my notes, make sure I didn't forget anything. Oh, yes, I do. Go back up here. Um, I got this other bullet point saying the less crowded alpha hydrogen will react first. So let's do the ketone. <laughs> We're not going to do all three of these, but that's okay. More examples might be more helpful. Okay. So we saw the mechanism, done with the mechanism. If you want to map it out again, we could. But here's the idea. Um, you can do the reaction more at one time because we have more than one alpha hydrogen. Okay, so if you start with cyclohexanone, there's four alpha hydrogens, add one equivalent of LDA. Sometimes you put that in there, usually we don't. Um, just because if you had two equivalents of LDA, you really can't form two ions on the same molecule. The whole molecule is a net minus two charge, and we're talking carbon here with the negative charge. That just doesn't form. So technically, you only need one equivalent. But if you add an excess, it only pulls off one alpha hydrogen. Okay, so let's say it's a symmetrical molecule, so it doesn't matter which side we pick. I'll pick the right side. So maybe this hydrogen is the one that's removed, and then the enolate that forms kicks out the iodide and adds a methyl group. So there's my methyl group. And now you can do it a second time. And you can change up the alkyl halide. Eh, I'll keep it with iodide. Okay, so now we have a choice. Nature, she makes a decision though. Um, there's an alpha hydrogen here and two more over here. And she says, you know what? This LDA is a bulky molecule. This is a tertiary hydrogen and these are secondary. They're less crowded. So let's go after those instead. So typically the major product is where the less crowded alpha hydrogen is going to be removed. So one of these is removed, forms a carbanion, the enolate, and then the lone pair bumps out this iodide at the end of four carbons. So the molecule had a methyl group, and then this side is going to add a butyl group, one, two, three, four. And a minor product, I'll put in parentheses, is where the beta group attached one, two, three, four, attaches to the same side as the methyl group. So crowding is really the major player here, but you could also argue from an electronic point of view that LDA would prefer to remove the secondary hydrogen, and not the tertiary one. Okay, this is a tertiary carbanion. This is a secondary carbanion. When we talked about carbocations, which one is more stable, a tertiary carbocation or a secondary carbocation? Tertiary, right? More carbons, more stable carbanion. And it actually comes back to Order of basicity, right? The methyl groups or the carbon groups are donating. They're donating electrons to the carbanion to stabilize it. So, right? So, if we had a secondary carbocation and a tertiary one, 
you could say, hey, this poor carbon only has two methyl groups supplying electrons. Each carbon is a methyl group, alkyl group, ortho pair donating group. This carbana has three. More is better. Pumping in more electrons, helping stabilize this positive charge. Tertiary is more stable and secondary. What about carbanides? Well, same thing. This methyl group is saying, hey, carbon, have more electrons. You're not so good. It's already negative. That's not helping. So the order switches. Tertiary um, carbocations are more stable than secondary, but tertiary carbanions are less stable. Chemistry is full of opposites, right? We just looked at the pKa table. Smaller pKa values make for stronger acids. But when you look at the conjugate bases, you flip-flop them, right? The weakest acid makes this the most stable base. Did I say that right? Flip-flop. <laughs> Same deal here. All right, enough about that. Um, just remember the pattern here. When you're doing um, multiple direct alkylation reactions and you have more than one hydrogen to choose from, go for the less crowded one. Both from an electronic point of view, less crowded means less carbon, fewer donating groups, makes for the less stable, sorry, more stable carbon ion. Um, but it's also more about crowding. Go to the less crowded one because your base is already crowded. So it'll be easier for the bulky base, this bulky base, to grab a secondary hydrogen rather than kind of squirrel in there and kind of eh, reach in there around all these bulky groups to try and grab that tertiary hydrogen, the more crowded hydrogen. And we're done with key concepts part one. So start key concept part two. Okay, so a little transition here. We're still gonna pull off the alpha hydrogen. But we're gonna do some different chemistry. So let's take a look at this. The, um, we're gonna look at aldol reactions, aldol condensation reactions, and there are other reactions similar to this. They're called Claisen. I know we saw the Claisen rearrangement, but now there's a Claisen condensation reaction, and there's a Michael reaction two of these named reactions. You've seen named reactions before, like Diels alder Yeah. So we're going to have um, these additional reactions be carbonyl condensation reactions. We'll do them in the next video. OK, what do they have in common? Well, you're going to connect two carbonyl compounds together. So maybe there'll be two ketones. Maybe there'll be two aldehydes. Maybe they won't be. Um, but they'll have. Double, uh, carbon oxygen double bonds. Now, what you're going to do is connect them together by combination of alpha substitution. Well, on the first one, grab the alpha hydrogen and remove it to form the enolate. And we're going to substitute this group, pull it out, and put in another group. It's going to be the carbonyl. So in the second step, we're going to have a nucleophilic addition or substitution reaction happening. And it begins, both the addition and substitution reaction, begins by bumping up the pi bond. So the Michael reaction, clays in condensation, and now the aldol reaction, they're going to all have the same pattern. And it just depends on the name of the reaction, depends on what the molecule actually is. Aldol reactions are going to deal with aldehydes and ketones. Clays in is going to deal with esters. And Michael is something a little bit different. We'll take a look at that. All right, let's begin with the aldol reaction. Okay, so this is our pattern we're going to look for. The aldol reaction, oh, let's scroll down a little bit. There we go. The aldol reaction is going to produce something called a beta hydroxycarbonyl group. Um, let's break down that name. You need to know this term, beta hydroxycarbonyl. Um, because on exams, it will, there may be a question, maybe, there will be a question that says draw the beta hydroxycarbonyl product. So you need to know what it is. Okay, carbonyl is talking about the aldehyde or ketone in this case. Beta hydroxy, well, you know the beta carbon, that's two carbons away from the C double bond O, right? The alpha carbon is the one next door, farther away is beta. And on that beta carbon, put on a hydroxy group. 
an alkyl group. And what you're going to get is because you start with two aldehydes, one of them is going to turn into a hydroxy compound. Your product's going to contain one aldehyde and one alcohol. So we're going to call that an aldol. Yeah. Okay, so this is how it looks. Here's the overall reaction. Um, you usually begin with one molecule. Let's say we start with acetone. And remember, if you're doing a reaction, you don't have molecular tweezers and grab one molecule and throw it in a beaker. No, molecules are incredibly small. You're going to hold, put a whole bunch of them, maybe Avogadro's number of them. So we have lots and lots of acetone molecules in a beaker, and we add a catalytic amount of base. Oftentimes, sodium hydroxide is used for convenience because it's found in every chemistry lab, essentially. But you can use other bases. I should pause right there. Um, sadly, some students, they focus on the sodium hydroxide as the clue to tell them when an aldol reaction is happening on the exam. And then they'll, they'll miss a question because the base won't be sodium hydroxide. So just be ready for that. Um, sorry, it's not always sodium hydroxide. So don't memorize this reaction by saying, oh yeah, when there's NaOH over there, it means aldol. No, it may not. Um, and another base might be in here and it, it means aldol. Look at the starting material. Here's a carbonyl group, a ketone in this case. You add a catalytic amount. Sometimes you'll see cat, sometimes you won't. And then one of these turns into a carbanion, an enolate. And then there's more of these molecules and you only use a catalytic amount. So you don't have enough for all the acetone molecules to form enolates. Only a few of them do. The rest of the ketones are like, what's going on? And this one says, aha, gotcha. Um, this is nucleophile and it bumps up the pi bond. And in the mechanism, yeah, I didn't start the mechanism right. In the mechanism, I'll show you all the steps you get your beta hydroxy carbonyl compound. So here's the first molecule and the enolate was here. Here's your second molecule, carbonyl compound was there and we connected these two carbons together. This oxygen is negative, but then it gets a hydrogen and now we have our beta hydroxy carbonyl compound or product. We can also zigzag this correctly. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. The Obano's on this one and on the alpha, nope, the beta, alpha, beta. Yeah, the beta carbon has a hydroxy group, but there's also an extra methyl group. So you can draw it however you like, just make sure it has the right number of carbons and the alcohol group is two carbons away from the ketone group. There you go. You see the mechanism. Well, it doesn't have to be. Here I chose to connect the two same ketones together, acetone. Let's start with uh, oh, acetaldehyde or ethanol. Um, what if we use this base? Doesn't have to be sodium hydroxide. Well, in the mechanism, let's draw the mechanism. Whoa, no. I know there's a hydrogen here, but that's not the alpha hydrogen. Here's our alpha hydrogen. The base removes the alpha hydrogen. Bonding electrons become the lone pair to create the enolate, our nucleophile. And a second aldehyde molecule is here. But you know what? I'm thinking ahead. Oh, no, this works. This works. I was going to try and redraw this so it would be easier to connect them together. But this works. Here's the mechanism. Bump up the pi bond, just like a Grignard reaction did. And now let's draw this first molecule on the right-hand side. And this one I'm going to draw on the left-hand side. If I put the old bond here, I have two copies of the same molecule. 
But in the second molecule, the pi bond went up on the oxygen. So that's negatively charged. And then the lone pair, these two dots became this line. The enolate carbon connected to the carbonyl carbon of the other aldehyde. Oh, I forgot my byproducts. I need it. <laughs> so in the base, uh, what is this? Methoxide ions, sodium methoxide. Oxygen grabbed the hydrogen. We created methanol. If you want to draw it that way, you can, or you can keep the OCH3 going. Uh, where's the sodium? Not stuck to this neutral compound. The sodium would be over here. So if you want to draw it, draw it next to your positive charge. Actually, you probably want to put it here. So if you wanted to draw the resonance structure, you can't move atoms in resonance structures. So the enolate would look like that. So pi bond moves up on the oxygen, creates a negative charge. This lone pair creates a double bond. And now the positive charge is still next to the negative charge. That's optional. Sorry, getting distracted. That's not part of the mechanism if you don't want to include it. Ah, but the point was the base forms this conjugate acid. I need that right here to be the acid so I can create the beta hydroxycarbonyl group. There we go. There's our mechanism. Oh, so much better than the malonic ester synthesis mechanism, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, checking notes. We're good. Let's see another example. Okay, aldehydes, ketones. Let's get a bulkier one. Um, did I put that in the key concepts? Is it equilibrium reaction? It is. So let's talk about that. This is an equilibrium reaction. So I should be using double headed arrows, not double headed, using these equilibrium arrows throughout, but I'm not a stickler for that. But if you go to a textbook or on the internet, the proper way to draw these mechanisms for aldol reactions is the use of equilibrium arrows. So let's talk a little bit about equilibrium. They're sensitive to crowding too. The equilibrium is going to favor the less crowded product, if you will. So if we have, where's my example? Um, here, I got this one. Oops, not there. If you start with this aldehyde, add a little base, doesn't have to be sodium hydroxide, you get the aldol, condensate, aldol reaction happening. And if I just want to draw the product, you don't have to show the mechanism, but the mechanism helps me predict the product. So one of these aldehyde molecules will form an enolate, and the other one won't. So now I am going to flip it. I need to have this lone pair bump up the pi bond of the other carbonyl. So I'll put the carbonyl this way. That's just to make it easier. And then I'll go ahead and draw in the, me the mechanistic step here. But all I want to do is I want to connect this carbon to this one. Hmm. And if I'm drawing the product, we can make that work. But I might tweak this a little bit. What if I drew it like this? So just kind of get this carbon right here. Might make it a little easier to, to draw. Okay, and then I got this carbon here, and then we have one more carbon, and there's my aldehyde. And that kind of gets it out of the way. <laughs> so I can connect this carbon to this one. So, you know, that's gonna be bump up the pipe on. Okay, so in our product, draw the benzene ring like this. And then the other carbonyl is going to be here. Um, originally, there's a double bond here, but not after the aldol reaction. This carbon connects to that one, and this one forms an alcohol group. And then let's check is it beta hydroxy? 
or here's the carbonyl carbon, here's the alpha carbon, and here's the beta, yep, on the beta carbon is the alpha, there's the product. I looked this up and the equilibrium reaction, if you start with an aldehyde, the aldol product forms a 90% yield. So in the equilibrium, it's 90% over here and only 10% starting material. So the product is favored in this equilibrium reaction. If you switch to a ketone, let's start with cyclohexanone, add the same base, doesn't have to be, but I don't wanna switch it and make someone think, oh, it's a difference of base that makes a difference here. And it's like, nope. If you use the same base, then you're gonna merge these together, do an aldol reaction where one forms the enolate, the other one is the electrophile. Um, that's where the pi bond gets bumped up. The lone pair is gonna to connect to this carbon, the carbonyl carbon, bump up the pi bond. And you're gonna make this product. Let's try a little better. This was the enolate. Oh, let's, let's move this one a little bit. Let's, um, let's have this. So kind of sorry, so if I put the double bond O here, that's my cyclohexanone. I'm just gonna connect this carbon to that one and make this the alcohol. This is my alpha carbon, here's my beta. Yep, double bond O, alpha, then carbon, then, sorry, alpha, then beta, then gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta. Yeah, okay. Um, in this reaction, this is only 22% aldol product. So in that case, the starting material is favored in the equilibrium. We're gonna have 78% of the starting material after the reaction's over. Not a, not a nice yield. So um, typically aldol reactions are performed with aldehydes, not ketones. And that might be the rationale why you really can't do direct alkylation on aldehydes. They more favorably do the aldol reaction. Okay, I think I covered the aldol reaction. Or did I? Okay, there's something called aldol condensation reaction and it comes from the aldol reaction itself. Um, the aldol condensation reaction is also called the dehydration of aldol products. And so here's the thing, um, it's an equilibrium reaction. So remember Le Chatelier's principle where you can shift equilibrium? There's lots of different ways you can do that. Um, but today what we're gonna do is, what if you just warm up the reaction? Just add a little heat. If you heat up the aldol reaction, or if you use sodium hydroxide, no, take that back. Doesn't matter which base you use. Um, after you heat it, you can release a molecule of water. And if you remove that water from the product side, You'll drive the reaction, drives, you'll shift the equilibrium to the product side by removing water. And now you get a new product called the aldol condensation product. What does it look like? It's an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. It contains either an aldehyde or a ketone and an alkene. So what the chemist said, well, if it was a ketone, it would be an own. You got the ene from an alkene, so you make an enone. So I need you to know this term. If the exam question says draw the enone, that's a clue that you're doing an aldol condensation reaction. Okay, what is the aldol condensation reaction? Well, let's start with um, let's start start with acetaldehyde, right? So let's go back. Well, it's right there, in the lower part of the screen. Put it in the middle. There we go. Okay, so we start out uh, acetaldehyde. Add a base. Okay, I guess I could use that base again. Um, you're going to connect them together to get the alpha beta unsaturated. That's not alpha beta unsaturated. This is the beta hydroxy carbonyl. I know all these terms. Aldol reaction. 
connect two aldehydes together. Make the aldol product. So let's do that here. So we add, I added that base or other base like sodium hydroxide. And then you get the aldol product. I drew it the other way. I put the hydroxy group over here. Okay, so you make this product, the beta hydroxy carbonyl. And then you can heat it or remove water. And what you'll do is remove this alcohol group and one of the alpha hydrogens. So you move an H and an OH. Hey, you remove water to create an alkene right here. That's conjugated, a conjugated system. That's more stable, right? So you have a pi bond, single pi bond, double, single, double bond. So like benzene, it's not benzene, it's not aromatic, but it is conjugated. And this is your enone. I know that's not a uh, ketone, but that's the common name for this type of product, an enone product. It is also a carbonyl that on the alpha and beta carbons has a degree of unsaturation. So the other name for this is alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. And again, the way it starts out, you simply add a calic amount of base, could be sodium hydroxide, doesn't have to be. It's an equilibrium reaction. You're producing a molecule of water. And so if you heat that, um, that helps this hydrogen to be removed and that alcohol group be removed in the presence of the base. And, um, or you can just remove the water byproduct. And if you remove products, the shot ace principle says, hey, the system's gonna, the equilibrium will shift to restore the products. So as you remove the water, the equilibrium shifts to the enone product. There's three ways you should be aware of to remove water. In the lab, you'd use distillation, distill the reaction as it's going, and you'll remove the product away from the water, and that'll drive the equilibrium to the right. You can add a drying agent. So during COVID, many of you haven't had hands-on laboratory experience. Um, hopefully you will at some point. But what's cool is you can add some salts, um, calcium chloride, magnesium sulfate, sodium sulfate are common laboratory drying agents. These are just salts that you add to your organic reaction. So, you know, maybe your organic solvent has diethyl ether in it or THF or using something, you know, DMSO, whatever. And if humidity, if it's left out too long, humidity can pro provide some water that'll dissolve in here. Or in this case, during the reaction, you're producing water. Or maybe your starting materials are contaminated with a little water. You might get a little water dissolved with these solvents. What you can do is put in these crystals. Now, you know from Gen Chem, you add these crystals to a beaker of water, the crystals dissolve. These are all water soluble. Um, solubility rules, might ring a bell. However, we, in our situation in the organic lab, we rarely use water as a solvent, right? Organic compounds are not water soluble usually. So you have to use other solvents to dissolve them. Water in this case is not your solvent, it's a contaminant. So now you add the salt and usually you add more salt than there is water. So water says, hey, there's salt, I wanna dissolve it, but there's too many crystals here. So the water starts to try to dissolve it and kind of gets locked up inside the crystals, finds those little crystal lattices. Um, sometimes you can see the little crystals in the lab start to dissolve, clump together from this, drop, this cloudy droplet at the bottom of your reaction. And you'd add more salt to clump it up to kind of absorb the water. And other water that's floating around in the solvent, well then you mix it, the water will actually move from the solvent into the crystal. And you've removed it from the reaction. So these drying agents are a nice way to remove water from the reaction and shift the equilibrium 
to the product side, creating more enone. There's also a really fancy device called the Dean Start Trap. Let's take a look at that. Oh, so don't freak out. It's not an exam, but hey, hopefully in the future, especially chemistry majors, maybe you'll get to use a Dean Stark trap. We actually have one in LMC, but the way it works is you start your reaction down here in this round bottom flask. Got a heating mantle, so this is the electrical outlet, or the, you know, the wire that connects to the outlet to heat this up. And this starts heating up and you start with a solvent, oh, in this case, they say, well, maybe we're using toluene, right? Methyl benzene, no, it's not called that, it's toluene. <laughs> Anyways, and you have your aldehyde or ketone in here and you have your catalytic amount of base, whatever, and you start heating it up. Well, as this boils, toluene and water will distill, will evaporate and go up into this condenser, right? We got water flowing through the outer tube. So you can see that this is a tube within a tube. So this is just inside the tube, there's just air here. And that's to prevent an explosion, right? As this heats up and liquid changes to gas, then the amount of gas in here increases, the gas pressure increases. And so you need a way to release that pressure. <laughs> Otherwise the glass may crack. Um, so as the gases, the vapors come off, water vapor, toluene vapor come in here, they hit this cold part of the glass being cooled by the water. And then the gas, the vapor will then condense in the liquid and drip down into here. Now water and toluene don't mix, right? This is completely nonpolar. It's only made of carbon hydrogen. Carbon, 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 hydrogens are nonpolar covalent bonds. Water, you know, is a very polar molecule. So it's just like oil and water don't mix. And the more um, dense liquid, in this case water, will form a bottom layer and the toluene will be on top. And so you keep boiling this, more vapor goes up here, condenses. The two liquids don't mix, they separate. Water goes down to the bottom and eventually, um, you know, if you didn't have the Dean Star Trap, this could all evaporate and the, the reaction would go dry and maybe burn. You don't want that. So instead, as more and more solvent evaporates, eventually this fills up and then it can spill back over. And what spills over is only the top layer, only the toluene. Very cool. So the toluene returns here. And if this is huge amount of reactants, you create a lot amount of, a lot of product and you're creating a lot of water as a byproduct, it's possible for the water layer to start increasing here and maybe spill over. So you have a stopcock here to release the bottom layer and capture the water here. Isn't that cool? Nice little bit of chemical engineering, the Dean Star trip. Not on the exam, but it's totally cool. What could be on the exam? How about a mechanism? So let's look at the mechanism. And the nice thing is, is you already seen the first half, actually more than that. To make the enone, you first make the beta hydroxycarbonyl. And we just went over that. So let's go over it again. Okay, so let's start. How about if I flip? No, if I flip the aldehyde the other way. Okay. Add your base, all your sodium hydroxide, show my alpha hydrogen. So in the aldol condensation reaction, starts out just like the aldol reaction, making the beta hydroxycarbonyl. So you turn here, make the enolate. So hydroxide ion grabs a hydrogen, turns in the water. A second aldehyde molecule is attacked by the enolate, bumps up the pi bond. And the first carbonyl then attaches to the second carbonyl. Gets a little pairs down that oxygen. And then this water molecule, whoops, 
acts as an acid. <laughs> Lone, uh, the curved arrow starts on the pair of electrons, grabs its hydrogen. And makes our beta hydro beta hydroxy carbonyl group. Excuse me, sorry to interrupt my own video, but in the original video, I made a mistake when I was doing the mechanism to make the enone. So let's do it the right way. So let me share my screen. We're picking it up right at the point where. I made the beta hydroxy carbonyl. Okay, and now if you remove water or you heat up the reaction and distill it, or you um, use the Dean Start track or drying salts, whatever, you can get the reaction to continue to the right. So let's see. We got the beta hydroxy carbonyl, right? Carbonyl is carbon oxygen double bond group. Two carbons away is the beta carbon, which has the alcohol, the hydroxy group. Okay, and then we made the um, hydroxide ion here. That's our catalyst. Hey, well, this is still an alpha hydrogen. <laughs> so this base can go ahead and just remove that hydrogen and recreate an enolate. So we got a resin stabilized anion here. Oh, before I forget. Hydroxide ion, grab the hydrogen. It got protonated and turned into water. And then why does this carbon have a lone pair negative charge? That's not good. Carbon's not electronegative. Well, that's because it's resonance stabilized, right? Lone pair can fall down to make a double bond here. Bump up the pi bond onto oxygen. Let's see. Currently, oxygen has two lone pairs. It's got an octet of electrons. Afterwards, it'll still have an octet but it loses the pi bond, which turns into another lone pair. And we have an oxygen-centered anion. And oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. It can deal with that negative charge a lot better than carbon can. So this anion is more stable than that one in terms of the anion stability. Okay, so resonance happens. We make this anion. Yeah, well, sometimes, the lone pair, instead of dropping down on the left-hand side, it can drop down on the right-hand side and kick out this hydroxide ion. Ooh, that's very unusual. Oh, I interrupted myself yet again. I should be using equilibrium arrows, right? This is an equilibrium reaction. Okay, but sometimes the double bond goes to the other side <clears throat> and displaces the hydroxide ion. You know, when we talked about SN2 reactions, we said, hey, hydroxide ion is not a leaving group. So here yet again is the exception. My hydroxide in this case is a leaving group. And then you get a new hydroxide ion that was kicked out here. And what is this? This is a double, single, double. We got a conjugated system. We got the alkene. And we have, uh, well, it's an aldehyde, but we could also think about perhaps making a ketone, an own, with an alkene, an ene, own. Yeah, this is the enone product. And on the exam, I'll ask you for one or the other. And we'll have to be, pre be prepared to draw the mechanism for the enone. Let's see, what else can I say about this? A couple notes if you're interested from, this point on, there's actually a name for this. It's called the E1CB uh, mechanism. You remember E2 mechanisms? It's a one-step mechanism, two curved arrows, had a carbon to uh, attach to a carbon and had a good leaving group, maybe a halide or a tosylate. And then we had a base. Why don't I use the same base for comparison? This is E2. Uh, the base grabs a hydrogen. These electrons turn into the pi bond of the alkene. And the leaving, gra um, leaving group grabs 
The bonding electrons turns into another, another lone pair. Base turns into water. Carbon carbon makes it an alkene. And then H, sorry, the H leaves with the water, Br minus leaves two. And we get in one step an alkene. The U1CB is different. We have a unimolecular step. Remember the one stands for one step is the slowest or rate determining step. And that's right here. Let's see, we got um, the lone pair waiting to kick out this group. It just self reacts. So you create this enolate, which is the conjugate base of the original um, alkene. What did I say? Alkene? No, this is an aldehyde. An aldehyde or a, a ketone. Anyways, instead of one step, this is the main point. Instead of one step where the base attacks, you immediately get the double bond, carbon carbon double bond. There's two steps. And this is very important on exams. I'll be looking for this if I ask you for the mechanism of the enone. First step, the base removes the hydrogen. You have to draw the at least one of these. It's preferable to draw the resonance structures. It explains why it stops here and doesn't keep on going, like the E2 reaction went, kept on going. Yes, yeah, so remove the hydrogen, get the um, enolate, right? The anion of the enol. And then later, the rate determining step, the lone pair has to come down, create the double bond. Carbon can't make five bonds, there's an unwritten hydrogen here. As a lone pair comes down here, creates a double bond, hydroxide will leave. Two more other ideas. Um, why is hydroxide leaving? Nature usually runs downhill in terms of energy. Is this more stable than this, this anion? And the answer is yes. If you go back and look at the order of basicity video, you'll see that, hey, carbon with a lone pair, is a much more reactive base, more unstable than when oxygen has a lone pair negative charge. If you look at the anion where the oxygen has a lone pair, um, then you might say, hey, that's apples, apples. Both oxygens are negatively charged. What's the difference? Um, the difference is in the enolate, there's a carbon atom attached to the oxygen and carbon is supplying electrons. It's an electron donating group. If it was on benzene, we would think of it as an activating group, orthopara directing group. And so this is activating the anion, making it more reactive. So the answer is yes. By kicking out hydroxide, which is really unusual, it is creating a more stable base. Another idea to think about, see if I can keep it on the screen, still give myself some room. Look at this product here, the enol with hydroxide ion, and let's draw it this way. So I just drew this the other way because this is how I drew it in a previous unit, um, previous um, video for unit two, our discussion of carbon oxygen double bonds found in aldehydes and ketones. And we said, hey, if you have an aldehyde that did not have an alkene. If you have an aldehyde or a ketone, you added water that had high pH, base catalyze, or at low pH, acid catalyze, you get the aldehyde or ketone to become hydrated, and you'd have a pair of alcohols here. Now that's if you did not have this double bond, but we do have a double bond. We don't get the hydrated carbonyl. Instead, you get conjugate addition. So way back in unit two, and we talked about conjugate addition, several reagents could react with all the hydrogen ketones that were conjugated to an alkene. And instead of the nucleophile attacking the carbonyl carbon, it attacked the beta carbon. We didn't call it that, but it attacked the alkene that was conjugated to the aldehyde or ketone. And in this case, the nucleophile is hydroxide ion, so it attaches here. So, Draw the starting material, remove the double bond, and insert the alcohol group, the nucleophile, and hey, wait, that's this molecule right up here. 
to actually go back to the starting material. So it is reversible. Okay, that was a lot of talking. Let's do a little bit straightforward example. One more time, put the whole mechanism all together. Let's start and do the full aldol condensation reaction. Let's go to the enone. And let's start with cyclohexanone. Gonna add base, sigma hydroxide. And we're gonna write out the mechanism. So let's grab one of the alpha hydrogens. And it does a little U-turn here. The bonding electrons turn into a lone pair. on that alpha carbon. Oh, and you also make water. The base grabs a hydrogen. And remember what I said about the sodium, it's a spectator ion. If you wanna drop it out of your mechanism completely, full credit. If you wanna include Na plus throughout your mechanism, all you have to do is place it next to an anion. That's what it's gonna do. It's just a spectator ion balancing the charge. It follows the negative charge. Okay, you make the enolate. And then it attacks its, you know, its twin, another carbonyl, and it bumps up the pi bond. One pair, you attach to this carbon, push those pi electrons up on the oxygen. And then maybe we'll draw the cyclohexane ring kind of on its side. And what used to be a double bond O becomes an O minus. Oxygen with a negative charge, and we connect the alpha carbon. Whoops, eh, it's not so nice. Yeah, no, I don't like it. <laughs> let's uh, let's use a cut and paste option. Give me this, and let's just move this down. There, that'll be better. I'll make it a little more clear. Don't you wish you could just do this on the exam too? I wish I could do this on the whiteboard in the classroom. Just cut, paste, and draw it. Okay, right, so the alpha carbon connects to the carbonyl carbon, what well, used to be the carbonyl carbon. Cool, and then um, we got the water molecule. So take that same water molecule, and this is a base. Water is a weak acid, so hey, do the acid-base thing. Transfer proton, H plus is a proton. Do a proton transfer. Or in other words, do an acid-base reaction. Copy our molecules and just put a hydrogen on that oxygen and make it into an alcohol. That looks a little bit better. Oh, what became of the, uh, um, of the water molecule? It became hydroxide ion. And if I were to ask for the beta hydroxycarbonyl, here it is, and it's, and that's where we would stop in the mechanism too. But hey, let's keep on going to the enone. So um, where's the acidic hydrogen? Well, this is acidic, but that just goes backwards. If the base removes this H, it turns it back in this molecule. Yeah, we're in equilibrium. That's not gonna be helpful. Um, this is, Next to the carbonyl, these two are both alpha. So yes, there's hydrogens on this side that are weakly acidic. This one's weakly acidic too, but it's actually more acidic than that one because this oxygen is, a, is electronegative. It's electron withdrawing. It's pulling on these electrons, this bond to this bond. There's a pull of electrons towards the oxygen, creating a greater positive charge. And this hydrogen becomes more acidic. A lone pair on the base grabs that hydrogen, and these electrons form another enolate. You know, how good is my microphone? Can you hear my cat? I hope not. That's a little distracting. Okay, we make the enolate. It's resonance stabilized. Again, on the exam, I would like to see this resonance structure. It's telling us why we're pausing. Why didn't we just do an E2 mechanism and kick out the hydroxide one step? 
because nature says that doesn't happen. Instead, there's experimental evidence in the lab that says, no, you stop here, you can, you can detect this molecule in solution during the reaction. And so our mechanism has to account for that experimental fact. But eventually, this is not the final product, um, the lone pair creates a double bond here and kicks out hydroxide. Double bond, so we've got a double single double, it's conjugated, and then let's draw the cyclohexane ring here. And then hydroxide left, and so we still have a catalyst. Cool. And then in my notes, in this specific reaction, cyclohexanone, cyclohexanone reacted with base, you get about 92% yield. So that works pretty well. That goes to the enone normally. Okay, I think we caught up, got the mechanism correct. So, hey, I'm going to return you to your previously um, started video. So we'll continue discussing this in the other video. Okay, last topic. Oh, you know what? Before I go on the last topic, <laughs> just want to add this idea about drying agent. So chemically, we talked about how adding crystals to this solution can absorb the water, remove the water, and dry the liquid. So if you go in the lab and we say, hey, I need you to dry your reaction, that doesn't mean evaporate it to dryness. No, it means add a drying agent to absorb the water that might be in your organic solvent. Um, and this extends to real life. If you've ever heard anyone order a dry martini, they're asking for a very strong alcoholic drink. If it's a very dry alcoholic drink, it doesn't, it's not diluted down with a lot of water. There'll still be some water in there. It's not straight alcohol, but a dry alcoholic drink means a lot of the water has been removed. It's drier, meaning it's not wet with water. Still liquid though, still a liquid drink. Okay, last topic, mixed aldol reactions. For the most part, we wanna avoid those. Why? Um, let's see, what else do I have here first? Let's make sure I'm not missing anything. So far, the aldol reaction has been self-condensation reactions. Oh, yes, they have. So what we've been doing so far is just taking one aldehyde or one ketone and a catalytic amount of base and getting products. And in a sense, what you do is you take one collection of molecules, split them into two groups, and one half attacks the other half, and you merge these two molecules together. And you can choose either to make the beta hydroxycarbonyl group or the eno. And on the exam, I'll ask you, I'll just say, hey, draw me the eno. Or I'll, I'll say, hey, draw me the beta hydroxycarbonyl. Um, because you don't, yeah, that's how we'll specify it. Okay, so it's been one molecule condensing with itself. Otherwise, called a self-condensation reaction. Okay, now in the lab, you could say, well, why can't I just have two aldehydes or two ketones and add a base and do an aldol reaction? Well, you can, <laughs> but typically you're gonna get four products, right? So as you mix a whole bunch of these molecules or a whole bunch of these molecules, add your catalytic amount of base, then you just have statistical outcomes. Sometimes the base will react with one of these, and then that molecule will, re will react with this twin to make this product. Okay, this is where counting carbons helps, although the color probably helps the most. There's two carbons here, and there's three carbons here. And if you look at this, there's two carbons, and in this part, is that part. So you have two plus two. So this molecule reacts with a copy of itself to make this product, or the base reacts with this molecule, and this molecule reacts with its copy, right? So you got three carbons connected to three carbons. So this one reacts with another one, another version of itself. Those are the self-condensation products, sometimes called symmetrical products. But then you can also get the mixed or unsymmetrical products 
what if the base attacks this molecule and then this molecule attacks that one? Well, that's this, no, that's this product. <laughs> if the base attacked this one, then you form this enolate. Yeah, CH2, two carbons here. Yeah, the base attacks this one. Then this one bumps up the pi bond here. Yeah, these three carbons then got attacked. That would create this mixed product. But there's also the other case. What if the base attacks this um, alpha hydrogen and this attacks that carbonyl? Then you create this product. And so generally you get like 25% yields of each one. And that's a low yield for like, suppose you wanted, hey, I really wanted this base to attack, not base, this enolate to attack this one. So I was really hoping to make this molecule, you only get 25% of it. And the molecule that you want is contaminated with all these other ones. Okay, that's usually undesirable. Usually you don't even wanna do this. Just avoid it. Figure out another way to make this molecule, not through a mixed aldol reaction. However, if you're familiar with chemistry, having exceptions, there's an exception here. So the guideline is, and that's all it is, a guideline, not a hard and fast rule. The guideline is avoid mixed aldol reactions. But we have two exceptions. Special cases, you can get a mixed aldol reaction and produce one major product. The special cases are, and these are the two you need to be familiar with. What if one of the carbonyl groups doesn't have any alpha hydrogens? So if there are no alpha hydrogens here, then the base has to only attack one of the molecules. And that would be found in formaldehyde, right? Formaldehyde doesn't have any alpha hydrogens. It doesn't have an alpha carbon, right? So here's a carbonyl group. The next carbon is the alpha carbon. Um, it ain't there. Doesn't have an alpha carbon. On the alpha carbon should be alpha hydrogens, not found in formaldehyde. And then benzaldehyde is another example, right? So here's my carbonyl group. Here's the alpha carbon, but there's no hydrogen here, right? Probably should get out of the skeletal drawings. The why, why, Dennis? Um, we draw the pi bonds. Then we'll see this carbon, the alpha carbon, as one, two, three, four bonds already. There's no hydrogen here. Doesn't have an alpha hydrogen. Okay, so if you mix one of these with some other aldehyde or ketone that does have alpha hydrogens, the base can only attack that one. And in that case, you have a chance of getting one major product. Um, the other case is where one carbonyl group is much more acidic than the other. So I'm referring to this table the pK table we saw earlier, right? So if you have a single aldehyde or ketone, the alpha hydrogen is acidic, you know, the pK value is 17, 19. That's kind of a high number, it's not very acidic. But if you have two ketones positioned this way, now the pK is nine, that's much more acidic than 19. Right, so that's the key that's for the second exception, is you use two carbonyl groups that have very different acidities. So see examples of that. Okay, let's start with the first one, aldehyde or ketone, I'm sorry, the um, formaldehyde or benzaldehyde. Let's start with benzaldehyde. Let's say we take cyclohexanone and benzaldehyde, and we add a catalytic amount of base, So now if we draw a little mini mechanism, we'll show the whole mechanism, but the base says, okay, where's my hydrogen? There's no carbs like acids here. There's no, where's my, oh wait, there's an alpha hydrogen here. And there's an alpha carbon here, but no hydrogen there. So the hydroxide can only attack one of these alpha hydrogens to make only this enolate, you know, the, the the carbanion could be on the left-hand side, but it's the same molecule. And then let's flip the benzaldehyde around so it's easier to draw the product. And then 
we're going to have the enolate attack this carbonyl and bump up the pi bond. And then why didn't this enolate attack a copy of itself? Well, the aldehyde is less crowded than the ketone. So that's in our favor there too. So and rather than attack a bulky double bond O, this is less bulky, it's an aldehyde. And so we are gonna get one major product. So the cyclohexanone, this carbon is this one. Draw the aldehyde, but don't make a double bond O. This is the carbonyl carbon here. Lost the pi bond, it becomes an alcohol, and we connect these two together. That's the beta hydroxy carbonyl. Or you can get, can I squeeze it in here? No, let's slide it over. Or you can get the enone product. Dobano, and then right here, where I had my hydroxy group, now it's a double bond. Do we go this way? Oh wait, that'd be five bonds of carbon. No, you go this way because it's conjugated with the ketone. Double bond, single, double bond. That's your, you know. How do you know which one you get? I have to tell you on the exam which one I want you to draw. If I just say, hey, predict the products, if I forget, you can give me either one. You don't have to give me both. But usually on the example, the format will be, hey, I'll draw all of this, and then I'll pick and put these words, one of them, maybe I'll pick beta hydroxy on one exam, and maybe I'll put enone on the other. And then you just look and see on the other side of the arrow, which ones Dennis want? Oh, he wants a beta hydroxy carbonyl. I'll draw that one. Oh, wait, you want enone? I'll draw that one instead. The second case, well, let's start with the same ketone, the cyclohexanone, and we're not gonna use aldehyde, benzaldehyde rather. Let's use, how about this one? Acetaldehyde, no, what is this? Acetoacetic ester, yeah, that's what this is. Now we'll add our base. Okay, so the base, comes along and says, okay, there's an alpha hydrogen here, and there's an alpha hydrogen here, and there's an alpha hydrogen here. Nature says, nature can be lazy. Let's make the most stable product. Which one takes the less, least amount of work? Which one's more acidic? Well, this hydrogen is only looking at one carbonyl group. So is this hydrogen, one carbonyl group. This hydrogen has two carbonyl groups. And when this hydrogen comes off, we're gonna get more resonance structures. It's more stable. So it's more likely to come off. It's more acidic. It's also an ester. Oops. What do you know about esters and reacting with bases from the acetoacetic ester synthesis and the melonic ester synthesis? You need the base to match the ester. Okay, so in this case, I would not pick sodium hydroxide. I would pick this ester group, an ethyl with an O. I would form sodium ethoxide and put that over the arrow. So draw either one of those structures. They're the same thing. Little aside, how come we have to match the base with the ester? There was an assignment on Canvas to try to map that out, help you see that. As a reminder, Let's just replay it here. There's a side reaction from unit three that we're trying to avoid. Um, if we had a carbon, no, if we had an ester, you can hydrolyze it with base. You can also hydrolyze it with acid. Hydrolysis, that's where you cut with water. Base catalyzed hydrolysis would cut the ester to form a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. Okay, so if you don't match the base with the ester, the hydroxide can cut this ester, and that's not what I want to happen. If you add the base, 
If you change your base and your base does match the ester, don't add any water. <laughs> but if you add this base, um, it's true this base does and can attack the carbonyl group. And in the mechanism, very similar to hydrolysis, the lone pair can come back down and kick this group out. So this group goes in and this group goes out. Wait, they're the same two groups. So even though the reaction occurs, you don't change the molecule as long as your base matches the ester. So take a look at that assignment. I think it's the uh, additional practice assignment from last week with malonic ester synthesis. Anyways, that's why you have to have the base match the ester. It doesn't eliminate the side reaction. The side reaction still occurs, but the net outcome of that side reaction is no change to the molecule. So match your base with the ester. And then we're going to do an aldol reaction. The base says of these three alpha height, well, there's fourth one over here. Doesn't matter. This alpha carbon has the most acidic hydrogen. That the base is going to prefer to grab this one. And we'll put a little mini mechanism here. You form this enolate. And this one bumps up the pi bond. And then you can also get two products here. You get the beta hydroxy carbonyl, and you could also get the enolate. Let's move this out of the way. Okay, so let's draw the enolate form here. Okay, and the alpha carbon is here. This alpha carbon is going to connect to this one. So let's draw. Let's draw. Let's move that. Draw here. Let's draw the cyclohexane ring on its side, and the double bond O would be sticking out here. And if you put a double bond O, that is the cyclohexanone. But we're connecting this carbon to this one, making this an alcohol. And then here's your carbonyl. Actually, this is the most important group, the ester. It's more highly ranked than the ketone. Ester has two oxygens. Ketone only has one. So from this most important group, here's alpha, then beta. Oh, but this is alpha, then beta. Good. On the other beta carbon, there's a hydroxy group. So that's a beta hydroxy carbonyl product. Or you can get the enone. So we draw the top part. We draw the bottom part. And now you lose the alcohol and you double up this bond and it's conjugated to the ketone. It's also conjugated to the ester. And so now you got your enone product. There you go. And again, on the exam, if I set up a mixed aldol reaction, I will specify whether I want the beta hydroxy carbonyl or the enone. Okay, and then one of these will be your major product. And you don't have to worry about cross products or anything like that. Hey, we're all done. I'll see you in the next video.